Um, but welcome to week one of this new BLESS series. And for anyone who doesn't know, BLESS stands for five very simple missional practices that we can all do. And I will come to that a, a little bit later. But of course, I do appreciate that for many of us, BLESS is not new. It's not a new thing. Uh, although there is one small but significant tweak that we have made to bless. So there is something new for everybody here. But uh, again, I'll come to that a bit later. But we did a series four years ago now, it was, that we did our Bless series where we introduced Bless to the church. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, as we intended, as we wanted, it's become very much part of the vocabulary and the culture of the church as one of the primary ways that we seek to reach out with the gospel, to reach out with the love of Jesus, to do evangelism to those around us. So I still have my bless list. It's, it's different from what it was four years ago. It's evolved and changed over that time. But I'm still praying for those people on my list and seeking to, to speak into their lives. And I know many of you also have uh, a bless list. We, as a staff team, we continue to ask every week, who have you blessed this week? Any blessed stories? And we continue to hear stories, small stories sometimes, but also sometimes big stories. They're kind of the real exciting stories. Um, so we're, we're, we're continuing to do that. And in the responses you heard on that video, you could just hear the influence of bless in how we go about making disciples. So people said things like um, the importance of, of sharing your life with others, getting alongside others, building meaningful relationships, the importance of your own story and being God's representation, his representative to those around you, impacting one life at a time in order to impact many lives. That's all blessed. It's all, it's all wrapped up in blessed. So it's very much part of who we are. It's part of our culture and part of what we do. But actually, we know, we all know those things that are important to us, those things that we consider core, do need constant reinforcement and reminding because we drift. Part of our nature. I drift, you drift, we all drift. That's why in recent months we've been talking about some pretty core things, like the series we did, Sit at His Feet, you know, just about that basic thing of spending time with Jesus and we've been talking about the church as family and we've been talking about being people of the spirit none of these things are new but they are all vital to living life for God to living life as a follower of Jesus and sometimes we need to come with a fresh focus on those core things as that's why we're coming back to bless over these next few weeks um, and of course for some of you this is an introduction to bless it this is this is a new thing for you and, um, well, we want you to get caught up in the mission of the church um, because we believe the mission of the church reflects Jesus' mission. And Jesus' mission was very clear. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's what he came to do. He said it himself. I've come to seek and save that which is lost. Then he passed that mission on to his followers, to his disciples. So Matthew 28, the Great Commission Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And of course, if those new disciples that are made really do obey everything Jesus has commanded them, then they will also go and make disciples because that is the command of Jesus to his followers. So actually, Jesus' uh, mission to us is to go and make disciples who make disciples, who will make disciples, and so on. And God's given us a vision here at King's for, for this particular church. He's given us a vision of being a diverse church of thousands that surrounds and saturates High Wycom with the love of Jesus. The thing is, for that to happen, for us to get anywhere near that, we need to see a lot more people saved. And that's what we want to see. We want to grow through seeing people saved. We need to see more lives impacted by the kingdom of God. And the only way that happens on the kind of scale that we want to see, the kind of scale, the kind of thing we see in the early church, and we looked at the early church a few weeks ago, you know, that kind of level of growth, well, we'd love to see that. Well, the only way that happens is when ordinary people are multiplying disciples in their natural networks. In other words, ordinary Christians sharing Jesus, sharing the gospel with their friends, with their family, with their work colleagues, with their neighbors, their natural networks, people God has put into your, into your life. Ordinary people changed by Jesus to change the world. That is the mission of the church. It is, it is Jesus' mission. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, this has to be top priority. It really has to be top priority for all of us. And bless is designed to help us pursue that priority. Because I know there are barriers that we face to pursuing this. Bless is designed to help us to pursue that priority. So I will unpack bless in, in, in brief a little bit later. 
But I just want to look first at what Jesus himself modeled for us in how to reach people with the gospel. Because it's always good to look at what Jesus did and then do the same, follow him. So how did he model it, how we reach people? How, do we make, how did he make disciples who make disciples? So we're going to look at John chapter 4. So if you have a Bible, do turn to John chapter 4 and you can follow the story along. I'm going to be kind of coming at it in sections and then saying a little bit about each section. So this is the story where we see the encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. So from verse 4, it said, Now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. And so he te- came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. And when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now the fact that this episode happens at noon tells us something about this woman because she is not there with everybody else when they would be drawing water at a cooler part of the day. She's out there in the heat of the day when she knows nobody else is going to be there. And it indicates, and it is confirmed later in the story, that she is something of an outcast in this village. There is a a reputation that she has. There's a lot of shame that is hanging around her, somebody with a questionable moral reputation. So verse 9, this Samaritan woman said to Jesus, you are a Jew, I am a Samaritan woman, how can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So here we we see evidence straight away of Jesus' mission to seek and save the lost, because he seeks this woman out. He's the one who goes and sits there knowing she's going to come. He's the one who initiates the conversation. He's the one who seeks and saves the lost because he wants to reach people who are far from God. Whoever they may be, ordinary people dealing with the stuff of life, even people who are outcasts, even people who have questionable reputations. He is there to seek and save the lost to reach ordinary people. And Jesus is crossing all sorts of barriers in talking to this woman. So there are all sorts of social conventions that he's just disregarding in terms of how men are to interact with women in that culture. But in particular, Jews interacting with Samaritans. They hated one another. There was massive animosity, centuries-old animosity between Jews and Samaritans. So you, you, this was unusual for Jesus to do this. It's not what you would do. He is crossing barriers and smashing conventions. He doesn't care that she is a Samaritan. Uh, or that she's a woman with a questionable reputation who's been rejected by her community. Actually, what we see is that Jesus treats this stranger as a friend. He comes to her as a friend, to her great surprise. And the thought kind of struck me, well, what if, what if we were a bit more like that? What if I was a bit more like that? What if, and I, I'm, I'm sure some of you, and I've seen some of you, do this kind of thing really well, actually. But what if we assumed friendship with people we don't know and treat them and speak to them as a friend? You know, the person on the train or the bus or at the checkout or somebody we bump into in the street or the neighbor that we don't really know. What if we assumed friendship with them and treated them as a friend? And of course, you know, Jesus crossed barriers to talk to this woman. Well, there are big cultural barriers to that kind of thing, particularly here in Britain. Um, and it won't take you long if you're from a non-British culture to notice this cultural thing in Britain. There are cultural rules which mean you don't speak to people on the train. You keep your head down. You stick to your own business. You don't do that. So there are cultural barriers, but what if we decided to break those rules and cross those barriers for the sake of the gospel? Jesus did. Jesus broke the rules, and he treated this stranger, even knowing what kind of a woman this was, she treated, he treated this stranger as a friend. Why? Because he's there to reach her. Because he loves her. Because he has compassion on her. And he does it in a very simple but powerful way. So Jesus cuts through all the animosity, all the suspicion, by quietly asking her for help. He comes in vulnerability. Will you give me a drink? And this places huge value on her. Because, you know, he is making himself vulnerable. He's inviting her to help him to serve him and so the doorway to the conversation that follows and everything that follows in this story that we'll that we'll come to in a minute the doorway is open simply through 
the honest expression of a basic human need and providing the opportunity for her to help him. It's simple, actually. It's really quite simple. We can all do this. Anyway, the story continues, verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So Jesus has taken it to another level here. He's, he's taken this conversation on very quickly. She doesn't really know what he's talking about at this point, living water and all this. She doesn't really get it. But Jesus is crossing another barrier here, something that can be a barrier for us. So having crossed that cultural barrier in how he's interacting with this woman and treating her as a friend, he's crossed that barrier. But now he crosses the barrier, which many of us find quite difficult, the barrier of spiritual conversation. Because he just made this jump straight into talking about living water. He's introduced something spiritual into the conversation straight away. Now, as we'll see a bit later, a big part of bless is all about building meaningful relationships with people. And how when you do that, when you focus on building genuine friendship with people, actually that can almost earn you the right to get into a more spiritual conversation. Because that person will ask you. And there is wisdom in that, and I'm, not, and I'm not saying we don't do that or chuck that out the window, but we mustn't be bound by that, because I think some of us can just spend the whole of our lives waiting for that moment to come, and it never does. And actually, we need to be prepared to introduce spiritual conversation, because it should be natural to us. Because actually, who God is and what he has done is what defines our lives. It's the most important thing in our lives if you're a follower of Jesus. So it should be the most natural thing in the world for us to talk about God with people and not be so oversensitive, ultra sensitive, oh, am I going to offend somebody? But Jesus wasn't too worried about that. I'm not saying we go in like a with our size ten boots and trample it. No, no. But Jesus wasn't too worried about causing offence because the message is not actually it, it's the message which has changed our lives. So we what if we were a bit quicker to cross that barrier and ask people what they think about God? You know, because it's who we are. It's like you know, you can say, "Well, I'm I'm one of these strange people who go to church and I, I believe in God." What do you think about God? I'd just be really interested to hear your. You know, what, what's your take? What do you think about Jesus and the church and the purpose of life? You know, what if we were a bit quicker to introduce that to conversation? What if we were a bit quicker to offer to pray for people? We've heard loads of great stories recently in in this church about people uh, offering to pray. Uh, for their work colleagues or for their neighbours, people who have a need and they offer to pray for them there and then and how that's been hugely appreciated by the person on the receiving end. So let's not be shy about getting into spiritual conversation. Verse 11, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So Jesus has taken this again to another level. He's now talking about the gospel. He's he's crossing another barrier, the barrier of the gospel. He's talking about how this water he gives... If you have this water, you will never be thirsty again. And actually, it leads to eternal life. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the effect, the impact this can have on your life. And then a bit later in the conversation, he declares to her that he is the Messiah. So he's crossing a barrier here and really talking about the gospel. But that's such an important barrier for us to cross as well. Because this is what makes the difference. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace is what has made the difference in our lives. Because we can talk about spiritual things at a general level. We can talk about um, God in general for years with people without ever actually talking about the gospel. And unless we tell people the gospel, you know, the, the, the good news of Jesus, how he really is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. Not one way, but he's the way. He's the only way to the Father. If we can talk to people about the forgiveness of sins and how he is the one who has transformed our lives and given us new life and a new hope, unless we tell people the gospel, they will assume we're talking about some other kind of gospel. They'll assume we're talking about religion rather than relationship. Or we're just trying to get people to 
you know, we're trying, it, it's, it's, it's a, a gospel of good works, trying to lead a good life, be a good person, or we're trying to recruit them to, to our church or whatever. They'll assume something else. We must share the gospel, the actual gospel of Jesus with people. And Jesus assumes that this woman will be thirsty without knowing the gospel. He assumes she'll be thirsty without it. We should assume the same thing of those people around us, that they will be thirsty without the gospel. They may not know it, but we do know, because it's our experience, that the gospel, that Jesus is the only one who can truly quench that spiritual thirst that we're all born with as human beings. We know that truth, so let's assume that people do need to hear the gospel. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and I won't have to keep coming here to draw water. And knowing what we know about her, you can see why that's an attractive proposition to avoid the hell of having to come out in the heat of the day where there's no one else there. And, you know, she is still thinking kind of on an earthly level, on a, on a very practical level. She doesn't fully understand what Jesus is telling her yet, but we can see she's drawn to Jesus. There's something about him. There's something about the words he's saying. She's drawn to what he's telling her. But Jesus doesn't just leave it there. He doesn't sort of say, right, this living water, give you eternal life, and then I'm going to leave that with you and walk away. No, he, he challenges her to do something about what he's saying. So verse 16, he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. See, Jesus really isn't afraid of causing offense, is he? I mean, <laughs> he steps right in there um, with this, this word of knowledge, this supernatural word of knowledge. But the thing is, he has cut right to the heart of the issue. This is the source of her shame. This is the problem for her. This is why she's rejected by her community, and she probably felt pretty exposed by that at the time. But that's not what Jesus, he's not trying to make her feel bad. He, he's not being harsh with her. Actually, it's a kindness to her, because we know that this gift, this free gift of living water, can't be received without repentance. Without saying, no, I, I will consciously turn from sin and turn towards God. And now we see that this woman's eyes are starting, just starting to be open to who Jesus is. So verse 19, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. So she's kind of getting there. She's not quite there yet. But then verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. He's pretty clear with her. Jesus is bringing a challenge. He doesn't just leave the gospel hanging. He is effectively challenging her to put her faith in him. I am the Messiah. I am the one you need to put your trust in. I'm the one you need to put your faith in. That is the way to salvation. And again, I think this is another barrier that Jesus has crossed by providing this challenge that we sometimes struggle to cross. We could even, if we're feeling really brave, we could get as far as saying, right, I, you know, I am going to share the gospel with this person. And you do. You share the gospel. You find out a way of communicating it. Share the gospel, but then never challenge them to respond. Probably because we don't really know how to. Not really sure how do you do that. How do you, how do you lead somebody to Christ? How do you do that? Or maybe it's because we're afraid of the possible rejection that we will face. We mustn't be afraid of crossing that barrier of bringing a challenge at the appropriate time. So in this dialogue between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, there's been a complete role reversal because she has gone from being the one being asked for water for a thirsty traveler, in effect, to be the giver of life to him. She's gone from being the giver of life to now asking him for the water he offers and coming to the realization of who he is, that he truly is the giver of life. And the incredible realization that the giver of life himself has come in weakness and in human frailty to share God's gift with her. Of all people, he's come for her. And so she sees the heart of Jesus. She sees his heart of compassion and love for her. That Even though she has messed up her life in many, many ways, she's living with this whole heap of shame in her life. He comes... To cut through all of that, 
to bring restoration, to do away with shame, and to bring transformation through this living water, through this gift, through a life-giving relationship with him. He brings restoration. Verse 28, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way towards him. So again, we see the restoration happening in this woman before our eyes. Her whole purpose in life has just changed. She leaves her water jar. Yeah, her water jar is an important thing for her, and it's what she was there to do. She was there to get water. Now she has a far greater purpose, and that is to go and tell everyone about Jesus, to go and tell everyone what has happened to her. And you notice what she says? It's not deeply theological. It's just, this guy told me everything. Come and, come and see him. He might be the Messiah. It, she's, she's, not, she's not got it all sorted about, you know, substitutionary atonement and, and the uh, doctrines of salvation. No, it, it's just... Come and see Jesus. This is what we're to do. Come and see Jesus. Come and see this man. They come to him because of her witness, this social outcast who was afraid of everybody, who was avoiding everybody in the village because of the shame she was carrying. Suddenly, total change. She is going and seeking people out to bring them to Jesus. Her purpose has changed. Then skip to verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, well, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know this man really is the savior of the world. And so this shame-laden social outcast of a woman has become very quickly a disciple of Jesus who makes disciples. She has become a multiplying disciple. And that is the call on each one of us, to be a multiplying disciple. And really the elements that we see within this story are encapsulated within that phrase I used earlier and the phrase that we often use to describe our mission here at King's Ordinary People Changed by Jesus to Change the World. That is what we are But it is also what we exist to do. This is what we exist for, church. This is our purpose. What we exist to do is to reach ordinary people who are far from God. Whether they're rich or poor, whether they have messed up lives or they have very well-ordered lives, whether they're outcasts or so-called respectable people, we exist to reach them with the good news that we ourselves have received. And we exist to reach them, to see them changed by Jesus because we can't change anyone's heart. Only the Holy Spirit can change people's hearts, just like this woman in the story was changed and restored through putting her trust in Jesus. But they and we are changed by Jesus in order to change the world. There is always an outworking to this, an outward outworking outside of the church. Change the world one life at a time, making disciples who will go and make disciples who will go and make disciples. We exist to see ordinary people changed by Jesus to change the world. That is Jesus' mission. That is the church mission. Is it your mission? Is it yours? Is it your personal mission as a follower of Jesus? Or is it something that in your mind, it's something that other people do, but not me? It's not really my responsibility. That's what, you know... That's what we pay church leaders to do. Or those people who are quite good at talking to others. If that is the mindset, I've got some shocking news for you, really, that this mission is not actually an optional extra for a follower of Jesus. It is the explicit command of Jesus. Go and make disciples of all nations. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded. The great thing is we partner with Jesus in this. We're not alone. We partner with him. He assures us he will always be with us in this, in this mission. But here's the bottom line um, that really I too easily forget and drift through my life completely oblivious and indifferent. The bottom line is this. that We are surrounded by people in our lives who, without turning to Jesus, are heading for eternal separation from God. That's the bottom line. We are surrounded by people who are heading for eternity in hell. And if we feel indifference to that, as I so often do, 
or we need to ask God again to break our hearts for the lost, to help us to see people as he sees them. I'm not trying to make you feel bad about feeling different. We all do. But we need something to shift in our hearts if that's the case. Many years ago, we were at um, Legoland as a family. Thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore. Um, and our son, Joel, was just three. He had just turned three at the time. And we were just about to leave. We were heading for the exit gates. And suddenly, we realized Joel is nowhere to be seen. And some of you may have experienced this as a parent or looking after a child, the heart-stopping moments when that happens. Of course, all sorts of thoughts go through your head. He had just run off, as young children do, with it completely oblivious. He had run off in another direction. We hadn't noticed. And thankfully, we found him. We did find him. There's a good ending to the story. But, um, but when that happens, what do you do? You start looking immediately. You start looking with an urgency. You don't sit back and think, well, he'll find us. He'll, you know, he'll appear at some point in the near future. No, you start looking straight away. And what, what's more is that other people start looking as well because they pick up the urgency of the situation. They see the panic on your face and what is going through your, your mind. Or you might be saying to me, have you seen the small boy? Have you seen him running? He's dressed in these clothes. Have you seen him? Have you seen him? And people will drop what they're doing. They'll drop everything and they will also start looking for this child they don't know and start looking as well. So you have this bunch of total strangers at Legoland motivated to change their agenda in an instant to look for our lost child. How much more, how much more should we be motivated to seek and save the lost because they are God's children, just like we are, and they're lost. How much more should we be motivated to change our agenda, to drop everything, to make this the priority, to see them as our Father sees them, to see them with the heart of compassion that God has and to seek to point them to Jesus. You see, evangelism, reaching out, is not just another duty. It's not just another thing on the list to do. It is about the heart of God. It's about the heart of our Father. It's about his heart of compassion. It's about loving people. It's got to be a top priority for us. Here's the thing. I guess a big barrier for most of us in this is that we just don't think we're very good at it. Reaching people, speaking to people about Jesus. We just don't think we're very good at it. And we tend to shy away from those things that we don't feel we're very good at. But this is where bless comes in. And I hope and trust will be a real help to us as it has been already. And I'm going to introduce bless very briefly today, knowing that in the next few weeks on Sunday mornings, we're going to be unpacking each element of it in a lot more detail. Uh, if you're in a blessed small group, you'll be talking about it there. You've got the pocket guides there on your seats. Please do take them away. Um, leave them somewhere visible as a reminder about bless. So bless. Bless stands for five very simple missional practices that anyone can engage in. So B is begin with prayer. Before everything, pray. Begin with prayer. And the idea is that you write a list of people who are in your life who don't know Jesus. It's quite simple. Write a list of people in your life who don't know Jesus and pray as part of that. Ask God, who, who would you have me put on this list? Because you might have loads of people and you can't possibly write all of their names down, but you can ask God, who are you drawing me to? Whose names are popping into my mind as I think about this? Pray into that process and then commit to pray for those people every day. I don't know, it might be you have a list of 10 people. It might be you have a list of five people. But commit to pray for those people every day and ask God for their salvation. Ask God for opportunities to bless them, for you to be in their lives. Ask him also for divine appointments. You know, bring people across my path today unexpectedly, the people who are, I can add to my blessed list in the future. So begin with prayer. L is listen. The importance of listening to people before speaking. Not that we shouldn't speak, as I said earlier. I think sometimes we can use this as a bit of a cop-out to never say anything about Jesus. But it is important to listen to people and not just leap in with our own agenda. Listen to their struggles. Listen to the things that they love. Listen to what's going on in their lives. But also, crucially, listen to God for them. Listen to what he is saying about them. Is he giving you something to speak into their lives? I mean, you see the power of that word that Jesus spoke into the Samaritan woman's life. It was transformational. 
So listen to God for people. E is eat together. See, this is really easy. It's, 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 the, these are things we can all do. Eat together. Great one. Why? Because when you sit down with people around a table, whether that's having coffee together or having a meal together, you just have a different quality of conversation. We all know this. It changes the way you interact. It builds a deeper kind of relationship. So be intentional about sitting down together with others. Coffee, meal, whatever it might be. Then the first S is serve. Serve people. Because if you're praying for people regularly, if you're listening to them, if you are um, eating with them, then actually in the course of that time, they will tell you how to love them. And opportunities to serve them will arise. They'll open up. Again, be intentional about spotting them and taking those opportunities. And then the second S, and this is where the small but significant tweak I mentioned earlier comes in, is for share. Okay, previously we just said story, and story, your story is part of this. Share your story, yes, but also share the gospel. Share your story, share the gospel. You see, if you are doing those first four things, if you are praying for people, you're spending time listening and eating together and serving them, actually sometimes it will work this way. The opportunity arises because they ask you, because they see something in you, the opportunity arises for you to share your story of your own life and how Jesus has changed your life and to share the gospel. But I would again put that caveat in that sharing might come a lot earlier in the relationship. We don't always have to wait for them to ask. It might be there's an appropriate moment much earlier. And actually that's the basis of building that meaningful relationship because you're opening up your own life and you're sharing who you are and what's important to you first. But your story of how Jesus has changed your life is the most powerful tool that you have. It's the most powerful thing you have because it's yours and it's undeniable. And you might think my story's not all that spectacular. It doesn't matter. It's your story. And if it involves Jesus, it is powerful. I mean, look at the woman at the well. It doesn't have to be complicated. Hers was very simple. You don't have to have a past in order to have a great story about Jesus. No, it is your story, whatever it is, and it's undeniable. So your story is really powerful, and we should look for opportunities to share that story because that is powerful. But what I've noticed is we can share our story, and then what? So, okay, we've been doing this. We've, I've, been, I've been praying for these people. I've been being intentional about spending time. And actually, I've had the opportunity now to share my story. Now what do I do? And really, this is why we've changed the S to share, to incorporate the gospel in here, to have a real emphasis on sharing the gospel, because we've got to be prepared at an appropriate moment, as I said earlier, looking through John 4, to share the gospel and to bring a challenge to respond where that is appropriate. But here's the thing, all of us can do those things, those five things. All of us can pray, listen, eat together, serve people, and we can all share. We can all share our story, we can all share the gospel, but where I suspect we need some help and some training and some equipping is on that second S. How do I shape my story for impact? How do I, how do I share my story with somebody? How do I share the gospel? How do I articulate the gospel to somebody in a a helpful way? How do I lead someone to Christ? I suspect that is where we need some help. And um, probably where Bless has fallen a little bit short over the last four years. So we've got Greg Downs coming. Greg, many of you will know Greg. He's spoken here before. He's an evangelist. And he'll be coming for two weeks of this series in November, the 6th and 13th of November, to help us with this. He'll spend one week on teaching us about how to share our stories. And then another week on teaching us about how to share the gospel, how to lead somebody to Christ. So we're going to bring in some equipping on this because I think we need it. But that's bless. Begin with prayer. Listen, eat together, serve, share. Share your story, share the gospel. The idea of bless is that you do at least one of those bless missional practices every day. So make sure you are praying every day for those people on your list. I think we can do that. Yes, you've got to set aside some time, but we will prioritize that which is important to us. Pray every day for those people, but also make sure you're being intentional about seeking opportunities to do the other things as well. The L, the E, the S, and the S. And just see what God does. See what he does. Because it is amazing, and I shouldn't be amazed, but I always am, that when you start praying intentionally, things start to happen. 
the number of people I've heard say that with bless. It's like I started praying for this person. They contacted me. Things will start to happen if you make that commitment to start praying for people. Make sure you're doing this along with others. So if you're in a blessed small group, the question will be asked each week, who have you blessed this week? And that's just a chance to share what's going on, what's happening uh, as a result of bless, as a result of pursuing bless. And it might be a small story. I, well, I'd started praying for this person. Actually, next week we're going out for coffee. That's a great blessed story. Don't dismiss it because it doesn't feel very exciting. That's a great blessed story because you're being intentional. Or it might be, I started praying for this person who I haven't actually spoken to for two years. And out of the blue, they contacted me. And now we're going out for a coffee or I've invited them over for a meal. That's a great story. So don't dismiss stories because you think they're not worth sharing. Share your stories because your story will encourage others. This keeps one another accountable. And if you're not in a blessed small group, get together with a couple of friends and just keep one another accountable. It keeps it right at the forefront of our mind. It means you're involving others in this really important journey. And I have so appreciated doing that for the last few years with the staff team. Every week, who have you blessed? Any blessed stories? Uh, and I've been encouraged by the stories of others, and I've been excited when I have a story to share myself. I think, ah, oh, great, I've, I've done it this week, I've got a story to share. And that's really great, it's exciting to share those, those stories. And I know that being intentional about bless has opened doors into people's lives that we wouldn't have opened otherwise. But I know on a personal level, I want to be bolder. I want to be bolder. I feel I've fallen short in this sometimes. I want to be bolder in sharing the gospel with people and leading people to Christ because I want to see this church filled with people who are new Christians, people who have come into the kingdom of God. So I'm really excited to have Greg join us and equip us. We don't have to wait until then. We can start having a go at this now. Even if you stumble, even if it's faltering, start having a go at this now. Also, later in the term, there'll be opportunities for those who want to for those who are up for it, to join in with a bless experience, a bless adventure. I'm not going to say much about it now, just that it will stretch you in courage. It will grow you in courage. So more on that later in the term. And really, final thing I want to say here is that one, one part of this story in John chapter 4 that I missed in going through it was when Jesus' disciples return to try to get him to eat something. But Jesus says this in verse 34. He says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He's saying sustenance and refreshment comes on this path of being missional. Don't be worried about not having the resources to do this. This will feed you. This is exciting. This is an adventure because you're partnering with Jesus in it. So sustenance and refreshment comes on that missional path of being partnered with Jesus. It's, it's part of the adventure of being a Christian. It's part of the adventure of following him. And then in verse 35, he said, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes. Look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. They are ripe. Jesus sees something his disciples don't see. He says, look, open your eyes, people. The fields are ripe for harvest right now, not in some future time, but now, and as God's people, as the church, we can spend so much time praying for some future revival and waiting. And let's pray for revival again, and then let's wait. But Jesus is saying, no, the harvest is now. It's now. And when it's harvest time, you leap into action. You don't sit back and wait. You leap into action because there is much to be done. When it's harvest time, you, it's all hands on deck Everyone, all your energy, all your focus, all your attention is, is put to bringing this harvest in. And so the implication is that as much as we might say and we might look with despair at our society and say, oh, look, people in our society, they don't really want to hear about Jesus. They're not interested. And sure, that is the case for some. But the implication is actually there are many people who are ready to hear about Jesus right now. And our job is to find them to find the people of peace, to find the ones who God has already been drawing to himself, unknown to us. Our job is to find them. God has told us he has many people in this place. So there will be people in your life. There will be people, some of them may be on your blessed list already, some of them may not be yet. They may be yet to add it. You may not have even met them yet, but there will be people in your life or coming into your life who are absolutely ready to hear about Jesus. We have to be the one to take the courageous step to tell them about Jesus. There will be people who are ready 
to follow him and then go on to lead others to follow him as well. Disciples who make disciples. That's how you get the kind of growth that we want to see ordinary Christians multiplying disciples in their natural networks. And that is the call on each one of us, all of us. We've been called to this town as a church to have a gospel impact. That's what we exist for. That's what we are here for. And we want to grow through seeing people saved. That doesn't happen if we just expect people to come in here to see what we're doing. Because we do Sunday meetings. And sure, sometimes you'll get people coming in off the street or coming in and, and, and getting saved. Praise God. We praise God for every life that is saved and redeemed. But we have to go and tell people. We can't just expect people to come because we're here. We have to go and tell. Jesus' mission was incarnational. God himself coming as a man, reaching people personally, up close. We are his representatives, so we are to do the same. Incarnational, up close, personal mission. That is what Bless is all about, and it is for all of us. It is for each one of us. And so my encouragement to us today is let's get on this crazy adventure of following Jesus and simply doing what he tells us to do. Who knows where it will lead you? Who knows what situations? But when we put our trust in him, life is an adventure. So let's go for it. Let's get on the adventure. Let's see what God will do. Let's be brave. Let's be bold, ordinary people changed by Jesus to change the world. Let us go and bless the world around us. Amen? Amen. Amen.